This is the Mitchell B-25, one of the most versatile fighting aircraft ever built. She was designed by North American Aviation of Inglewood, California. The first prototype rolled out for a test flight in January 1939. She was designed as a medium bomber with a crew of five, pilot, co-pilot, bombardier, radio gunner, and gunner. She was named for the man many consider the father of American military aviation, General Billy Mitchell. The B-25 was powered by two 1,700 horsepower Wright engines. She could carry 2,400 pounds of bombs and reach a top speed of 322 miles per hour. She had a range combat loaded of 1,350 miles. At her peak, after many modifications, she was armed with eight 50 caliber machine guns in her nose, two in her tail, one each on either side of her fuselage, and two 50s in the turret atop the aircraft. She was also known to carry the largest weapon ever installed in an American bomber, a nine foot, six inch long, 900 pound, 75 millimeter cannon. She was an awesome weapon. At the outbreak of World War II in December 1941, the Mitchell went on patrol in American waters looking for German submarines and was credited as the first American bomber to sink a German sub in the Atlantic Ocean. The Mitchell didn't have to wait long into the war to make a name for herself. Early in 1942, a Navy captain by the name of Francis Lowe saw two B-25s flying over the outline of an aircraft carrier deck painted on the runway of a military airfield in Virginia. He got the idea that Army bombers just might be able to take off from the deck of a Navy aircraft carrier and hit the target everyone in America was just itching to hit after the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor the Japanese mainland. Captain Lowe immediately took his idea to the brass in the Pentagon. A concept of operation was prepared and two B-25s were dispatched to Norfolk, Virginia to test the feasibility of the plan by taking off from the deck of the USS Hornet. The way the Mitchells jumped off the deck of the Hornet gave General Hap Arnold of the Army and Admiral King of the Navy confidence that the B-25 could do the job. Navy Captain Duncan, who had been the naval attache to the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo for several years prior to the war, was named as the overall coordinator of the mission. And Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle of the Army was put in charge of the aircraft. The 17th Bomb Group of South Carolina was chosen to fly the mission because they were the most experienced B-25 personnel in the Air Corps. But because of the immense danger inherent in the mission, men were not ordered to participate. They had to volunteer. The entire group volunteered. From those and personnel from the 89th Recon Squadron, Doolittle put together his team and proceeded to train them. The B-25 then had to be modified, tailored to accomplish the mission. The ventral turret was taken out and fuel tanks were added that increased the range of the aircraft. Lest it fall into the hands of the Japanese, the top secret Norton bomb site was replaced by a dime store wonder called the Mark Twain. The twin 50s in the tail were removed and two broomsticks painted to look like 50s were installed. The crews underwent training at a secret airstrip at Eglin Field in Florida. The pilots had to learn how to take off within the distance of a football field, 300 feet. Meanwhile, Captain Duncan went to Pearl Harbor and briefed Admirals Nimitz and Halsey on the planned raid of Japan. At the completion of their training, the crews loaded up and flew across the country mostly at very low level to San Francisco. He 
In their orders, it was specifically forbidden for any B-25 to fly under the Golden Gate Bridge. But perhaps predictably, it proved too much of a temptation for one pilot. Sixteen B-25s were then lashed to the decks of the USS Hornet, and the aircraft carrier immediately put to sea. Eleven days later, on April 13th, the Hornet rendezvoused with Task Force 16, commanded by Admiral Bull Halsey, and proceeded toward Japan. The plan called for Doolittle's B-25s to take off 450 statute miles from Japan. One thing that worried the commanders was premature discovery of the task force by Japanese patrol craft. It was therefore decided if they were spotted while within range of Honolulu, the mission would be aborted and the Mitchells would immediately take off and fly to Honolulu. If they were discovered within the range of Midway, they would abort to Midway. If out of the range of Midway and out of the range of Japan, the B-25s would be sacrificed to save the task force and pushed over the side so that the Hornet's own tactical fighters could protect the task force. If within range of Japan, the B-25s would take off and bomb their assigned targets, even though there was a high degree of certainty that the aircraft would run out of gas and the crews fall into the hands of the Japanese. task force sweated it out for five more days. Five days of briefings and watching and waiting and trying to stay loose. Then on the morning of April 18th, some 400 miles from their takeoff point, the task force spotted a Japanese fishing vessel on the horizon. Fear that the vessel had signaled the homeland raced through the task force. The order to man the B-25s was given immediately. A little Japanese trawler must have thought the world had come to an end when two U.S. cruisers accompanying the task force opened up on her with their six-inch guns. She was soon dispatched to the bottom of the sea. That morning, the weather was rough. There were heavy seas, and a 30-knot wind was blowing across the bow of the Hornet. This, added to the 20-knot speed of the Hornet, gave an effective 50-knot wind across the bow. This 50-knot wind made takeoff conditions very good indeed. More wind meant more lift. was the first to roll down the carrier deck and lift off over the sea. Then 15 more B-25s followed. Despite a couple of close calls, all the Mitchells made it off 
the wildly pitching deck of the Hornet and proceeded on to Japan. Meanwhile, some 650 miles away, the people of Japan were participating in a very realistic mock air raid drill designed to test the country's readiness for attack by enemy aircraft. They went about their drill with typical Japanese thoroughness, never dreaming what they were preparing for would fall upon them that very day. Ironically, that air raid drill may have helped the American mission. The Japanese defenders at first thought the attacking B-25s were part of this very realistic drill. And the Doolittle Raiders struck the Japanese mainland, for the most part, unopposed. As they had in their flight across the American continent to San Francisco, Doolittle's Raiders approached their Japanese targets at treetop level. When they were near their targets, they climbed to 1,500 feet and dropped their bombs. The reason for the altitude was to minimize damage to the B-25s from their own bombs. A way to avoid this problem and remain on the deck even while bombing was developed later in the war by General Kenny. their payloads, the pilots again dove for the treetops, took evasive action, and flew on not knowing where the remaining fuel would take them. Originally, the plan was for the Mitchells to home on Chuchao, China, but the homing device that was supposed to make that possible never arrived. Most of the pilots managed to fly to East China, where they either crash-landed their aircraft or bailed out. One plane flew to Vladivostok, Siberia, where its crew was interned by the Russians. Five men were killed in China, four by drowning, when their plane went down in the surf off the China coast. Eight others were captured by troops loyal to the Japanese. As part of their training, the raiders had been taught to say, I am an American in Chinese. Unfortunately, it proved to be the wrong dialect. Those who survived the raid made their way to Chongqing, where they were given a hero's welcome and decorated by Madame Chiang Kai-shek. The eight captured raiders received harsh treatment at the hands of the Japanese. Three were executed, one died of malnutrition, four remained prisoners of war till they were liberated in 1945. Although the actual damage done by the bombs dropped by Doolittle's raiders was minimal, the raid was a stunning psychological blow to the Japanese people. And for the first time since the embarrassment at Pearl Harbor, there was good news to report about a war which at that point wasn't going America's way. But more was accomplished than raising Allied spirits. Japan read in the raid the message that the Japanese mainland was within the striking reach of the United States, and therefore the defenses of the mainland had to be strengthened and maintained. Hundreds of planes that were desperately needed by Japanese commanders in the Pacific, planes that could have made the difference, perhaps even turned the tide, were kept at home waiting for the next American raid. But the American commanders had no plans for a follow-up raid for some time to come. For his handling of the mission, Jimmy Doolittle was promoted to Brigadier General and awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor.
In November 1942, Allied forces invaded North Africa. The expeditionary force pushed the Germans and Italians back halfway across the African continent. Then a combination of weather, lack of supply, and stiffening enemy resistance brought the Allied advance to a halt near Tunis. General Eisenhower paid a visit to the Allied troops, and after assessing the situation, canceled an impending attack against the German positions in Tunisia. Instead, he ordered his commanders on the ground to consolidate their positions, rebuild their supply, and wait for the crippling winter weather to pass. Although Field Marshal Rommel, the Axis commander, had been pushed back halfway across Africa, he was far from defeated. He too was consolidating his forces and rebuilding his supply. Then in February 1943, Rommel suddenly launched an all-out attack on Allied positions. Winter weather had turned the impromptu airfields the Allied forces had built as they leapfrog across the top of Africa into mudflats. German aircraft, on the other hand, operated from all weather strips, giving them, for the moment, a huge edge. And they took advantage of it. But with the coming of spring, weather conditions changed. The ground hardened. Allied supplies had been restocked. General Eisenhower returned and again assessed the situation. The brass conferred. Generals Arnold, Boyce, Brereton, Casada, and Spots. And this time, the order went out. Attack, attack, attack. The big push to destroy the fascist army in North Africa was on, and the B-25 had its role to play. While Montgomery's foot soldiers attacked the German and Italian armies on the ground, the Air Corps, now operating from hardened strips, was unleashed against the Desert Fox and his army. The Air Corps went to work on the African Corps. And when the smoke had cleared, the Axis army was crushed. The Allies had broken through, and a quarter of a million Axis soldiers raised their hands in surrender. Tunis was liberated. A launching pad for the invasion of Europe was secured, and the people of North Africa showed their appreciation. The Mediterranean island of Pantelleria, off the coast of Italy, was an enemy stronghold that had to be taken in preparation for an invasion of Italy. Jimmy Doolittle once again found use for the B-25, attacking Pantelleria. Mussolini boasted that Pantelleria was the Italian Gibraltar, that he could summon over 900 aircraft to the island's defense. The island was honeycombed with natural underground hangars, 80 gun emplacements surrounded the island, and the defenders were determined that Pantelleria would never fall. Unless the Allies could come up with a breakthrough plan, 
the invading force would pay a high price for the island. Operation Corkscrew was born. Up until the Second World War, the traditional method of taking real estate from an enemy force was with infantry troops. But with the maturing of the air arm, military commanders now had a new, yet untested way of doing things. It was decided to take Pantelleria by air. The plan called for two phases, a softening up phase and a knockout phase. The softening up phase lasted 18 days. In that time, all hell fell on Pantelleria. A thousand fighting planes took off from bases one in North Africa to soften up the island. In raid after raid, B-25s and other attack aircraft dumped their ordnance on the fascist fortress. Then on 6 June, the knockout punch began. This was to be an all-out, round-the-clock assault, building in intensity until the fascist either surrendered or were annihilated. For the next five days, more than 5,000 tons of bombs fell on the island, a concentration of explosive ordnance unequaled in warfare up to that time. The earth rocked. Amazingly, the enemy still answered back. It looked like Pantelleria would have to be taken the old-fashioned way, with bullets, bayonets, and brave soldiers. But it was decided to give air power one more chance to bring the enemy to his knees. Then, as the next wave of death and destruction prepared to assault the island, a white flag was seen atop Semaphore Hill. The defenders had had enough. Pantelleria had fallen. And a new era of warfare from the sky was born. An invasion force of British troops set sail from North Africa to occupy the island. So successful had been the air operation that hardly a shot was fired at the invaders. In fact, the only Allied infantry casualty was not caused by a fascist soldier at all, but by a jackass that nipped a British Tommy. As the Allies took control of the island, they were impressed by the thoroughness with which the bombers had done their job. Destruction was everywhere, and so were the once defiant defenders, their white flags held high over their heads. During the next phase of the operation, Pantelleria was turned into an Allied airbase with its eye focused firmly on the boot of Italy. The Italian campaign was rough, slow going. The enemy had 24 divisions against our 11, and they were well dug in. The war seemed to come to a stalemate around Casino, where we were fighting an artillery duel with the Axis forces. Neither side seemed to be able to gain the upper hand. Germans had turned the abbey at Monte Cassino into an observation post from which they could call down fire on Allied troops. This presented Allied commanders with a difficult choice. They could either preserve the abbey and risk the lives of our soldiers, or they could treat it like any other military target and destroy it. The Germans were counting on our choosing to spare the abbey. Generals Aker and Evers met and assessed the situation. After weighing the options, they decided to bomb the abbey at Monte Cassino.
B-25s and other bombers started pounding Axis positions. The Abbey was not spared. Axis troops were well disciplined. The more we pounded, the deeper they dug in. And no sooner had our bombers dropped their last bombs than the enemy came out of their holes answering fire with fire. We were still stalemated. It was then decided in effect to starve them out. Starve them of the materials essential for warfare. Food, ammunition, personnel, equipment. Those things that are the life's blood of an army. Our bombers began taking Italy apart. Trains were interdicted. Shipping sunk. Bridges pulverized. Until the Axis army was defeated and the Italian people liberated. With one foot solidly planted in Italy, the Allies wanted very much to put another one down in France. The B-25 had its role to play there also. Here, B-25 crews planned the bombing of targets in southern France, which would soften up the enemy for yet another Allied advance. This was a world at war, and the adaptability of the B-25 had many more tests to pass. The China-Burma-India theater presented B-25 crews with an altogether different challenge than they had experienced in North Africa and Europe. General Stilwell was attacking Japanese positions in Burma from positions in China hundreds of miles from any seaport or railhead that could supply him. His army was totally dependent on the Air Corps for support. Stillwell's push against the Japanese would have stalled in the jungle if it had not been for the Air Corps. Even Stillwell's wounded depended on the Air Corps, getting them to medical attention beyond that immediately available on the battlefield. While air transports took care of Vinegar Joe's supply needs, the B-25s helped seal the fate of the Japanese by cutting them off from any source of supply. Stillwell's army fought the Japanese on the ground. In the air, B-25 selectively took out bridges and other targets, which accelerated the collapse of the Japanese war machine. In Burma, as in Europe, the B-25 was primarily used as a bomber. But in the Southwest Pacific, the B-25 found a new role. New tactics were devised to take advantage of the Mitchell's versatility. 
Here, the B-25 is being outfitted with the largest weapon ever used in an American warplane in the Second World War, a 75 millimeter cannon mounted in the nose. The M4 cannon measured nine feet six inches and weighed 900 pounds. 21 rounds were carried and the navigator became the cannoneer. The pilot used the tracers from his 50 caliber machine guns to mark a target. When he snapped off a round, some crews said because of the recoil from the cannon, their B-25s actually flew backwards for a microsecond. The weapon proved especially effective against shipping. The Southwest Pacific was island warfare. Aircraft had to be able to travel great distances over water and attack a target. Twin-engine Mitchells were ideally suited for this kind of warfare. They had the range, speed, and maneuverability required for hit-and-run tactics. In the Pacific, the Japanese had put together an intricate network of mutually supporting strongholds, which covered the islands of the Southwest Pacific like a giant web. Bit by bit, B-25s began taking the web apart. General George Kenney and his staff mapped out the strategy for putting air power to its best use in this war for the islands. As we dismantled the Japanese web, we started putting together a network of our own. We established airfields and stocked them with the ordnance that would destroy the Japanese Imperial Army. On the ground, the men who flew the Mitchells had a very large supporting cast of men who never flew a mission. Without the ground crews, stockpiling the bombs, loading ammunition, maintaining and cleaning the aircraft, packing the bombs, and preparing the planes for their missions, the B-25s would never have gotten off the ground. One of the major strongholds of the Japanese in the Pacific was at Rabaul on New Britain Island. Rabaul was a formidable concentration of military might that had to be smashed if we were going to make headway in the Pacific. Rabaul had felt the sting of Allied bombs since January of 1942, but no knockout punch had been delivered. Then late in 1943, a major attack was planned and coordinated to inflict maximum damage to Rabaul and diminish its effectiveness as a military base of operations.
Early in the morning of November 2nd, 1943, crews were briefed on the raid on Rabaul. After the briefings, the crews went to their aircraft. The raid on Rabaul was on. this presentation, it may have been noted that the turret atop the B-25 is not in the same location on all aircraft. The change in turret location was a result of commanders adapting the aircraft to changing conditions. Most of the changes in turret location were accomplished in the field, which is a tribute to the adaptability of the B-25. At one time, a single stabilizer was favored for the B-25 over the distinctive twin stabilizers. But turret gunners kept shooting up the single stabilizer. The Air Corps, after replacing a lot of stabilizers, decided that the ability to shoot straight backwards gave the aircraft better rearward protection. And that was best achieved with the double stabilizer, like the kind seen here in these Mitchells, which are about to attack Rabaul.
spotted. And the Mitchells go into their attack positions. aircraft positions defending the ball. So effectively did the Mitchells suppress anti-aircraft fire that they were able to make direct strafing runs on Rabaul's airfields. Low-level strafing was a very effective tactic developed for B-25s in the Pacific. The 850 caliber machine guns in the nose of the aircraft chewed Japanese defensive positions to pieces and left Nippon aircraft in shreds. The raid on Rabaul lasted only 12 minutes. But in that time, 94 enemy aircraft were destroyed, 24 ships were bombed, and 17 strafed. Ironically, the Japanese interpreted all this attention as evidence that we were planning to invade Rabaul with ground troops, and they rushed reinforcements to the area. But the Allies had no such intention, and Rabaul was left to wither on the vine. Its 100,000 soldiers were left without a battle to fight, while the B-25 went on to other targets. In the Doolittle Tokyo raid, the Mitchells had to climb to 1,500 feet before dropping their bombs so that the planes wouldn't be damaged by their own ordnance. General Kenny had found a way to solve that problem. Here, bombs are delivered at treetop level attached to parachutes, which delayed their landing long enough for the B-25 to fly safely out of harm's way. It was a very effective innovation. Rabaul was the hub of the net. But the B-25 didn't stop there. They attacked Japanese strongholds all over the Pacific. Wewak, Nubia, Hansa Bay, Alexis Haven, Madang, Cape Gloucester. These were the threads that held the web together. The B-25 tore the web apart. The Japanese Imperial Army was heavily dependent on shipping for its survival. The B-25 made war on that shipping. The combination of 75mm cannon and the 50 caliber machine guns delivered a one-two punch that was devastating. And as each ship was sunk, each airhead strafed, each gun emplacement bombed. The web of Japanese tyranny broke apart, and the rising sun began to sink into the Pacific. The Allies now turned their attention to the chain of islands where the American people early in the war felt the despair of defeat, the Philippines. MacArthur had vowed that he would return, Late in 1944, he and General Kenny met to map out the plans for the liberation of the Philippine Islands. The B-25 had a big role to play in those plans. The success of the Philippine campaign depended on isolating the enemy forces on the islands from the Japanese war machine. The B-25 got a big piece of that mission. The tactics that had been developed in three years of war Low-level parafrag bombing and strafing with machine guns and 75mm cannons were now brought to bear on the enemy in and around the Philippine Islands. The battle for control of the sea lanes around the Philippines was on. Then ship to ship, island to island, 
we fought our way back. Corregidor, the rock, the once proud home of the American garrison, now the stronghold of the Japanese war machine. Now the promise was near, now the score could be settled. The festering open sore that Allied soldiers had carried in their hearts for three long years would be addressed. Now the humiliation and inhumanity of the Bataan death march would be avenged. Now the solemn pledge of a commander could be kept. The wrath of a nation, the passion and skill of her commanders, the savagery of her warriors, fell on the Japanese at Corregidor. flag that once again fluttered in the breezes of Corregidor. From the islands of the Pacific to the jungles of Burma, to the ancient roads of Europe, to the muddy fields of North Africa, to the skies above Japan, the B-25 carried the terrible swift sword of American resolve to defeat the forces of tyranny and oppression. Doolittle, Halsey, Eisenhower, Arnold, Stillwell, Kenny, MacArthur. These are the names we remember, but it is to those forgotten warriors, some of whose faces are recorded here, that a nation rises and salutes a job well done. Well done, indeed. Summing it all up, reflecting on the exploits of those common men, many of whom never returned to their families, Men who met an uncommon mission with all the skill and courage that was in them. Men who climbed into an aircraft and did battle against an angry enemy. No greater tribute can be given than this. The Mitchell B-25, man and machine, accomplished the mission.